when the scripture says that you shall know the truth and the truth shall set you free. When Jesus leaves his disciples, he says, I have many more things to tell you, but you ain't even close to being able to receive them. I will send my spirit, says another helper, <coughs> not when you don't have him. That indicates it's something different than the spirit of God. It's a weapon crafted to do battle against the enemy. That's just a thought. It says I'll send you another helper. So we have, have each other, we have prayer, we have the spirit of God. And they had the Lord Jesus with them at that time. He says, I'll send you another helper of Gabriel. Mm -hmm. But the scripture doesn't say it's at a great cost, a great price, that you shall know the truth. Some Christians think they already know the truth. God said it, I believe it, and that settles it. And they keep marching towards the grave. And they don't even know what they're supposed to do. You shall know the truth, and the truth shall set you free. been very expensive to us here, and sometimes I can have little pity parties. Isaiah Salvador preaches a hard, believe in Jesus or burning hell forever message. He preaches a lot of other really good stuff, too. that stuff. This church grew faster than in any other time in history. Catherine Coleman was praying when she was alive and didn't know she wasn't supposed to die. And a little four-year-old kind of just wouldn't be shut and said, I saw Jesus standing beside you. When she got home, Mom had a picture of Jesus on the wall. And she said, that's who I saw standing to preach that heavy message built on guilt and fear. This church grew faster than any other time in its history. Because I had somebody else standing beside me that loves that message. You understand what I'm saying? Guilt and fear. It's never from the Lord. Perfect love casts out fear. Well, I have to be afraid. If I if I do something wrong, I'll go to hell. I have to be my I have to be afraid for my children. If they don't straighten up, I know they're going to hell. My former pastor used to worry that the Lord would come back before his children said a sinner's prayer with him. And if the Lord came back before they said a sinner's prayer with him, that means he would go to heaven, but they would burn in hell forever. So the whole time I was headed in the wrong direction, doing stuff that didn't matter. And it wasn't the Lord Jesus that was blessing me. So I'm taking very seriously this kind of series that I call 
setting the record straight. Jesus Christ has been cursed by the lips of more beings than any person, ideology, or thing on the earth. The one who is full of love and redemption for everyone that curses him, for everyone that backslides, for everyone that takes drugs, for everyone that's a prostitute, the one who loves him the most, even the one who curses him. more than any other living person or thing. And I tell you this this morning, the death of that person will not come close to the death of the praising when people finally know who he is, finally understand what he means. The depth of praising will far exceed the depth of person. But the enemy tries to keep us from knowing. The enemy will try to keep you from coming here and understanding the truth about Jesus Christ. I'd rather have you think that Satan kills people and our Father kills people. Years ago when I used to go to movies, I went to see a movie called True Lies. Wish I hadn't gone simply because of Jamie Lee Curtis, whatever her name is. Are we all right? But when she finds out that her husband is uh, a double agent, she says, have you killed people? And Arnold Schwarzenegger says, yeah, but they were all bad. So people don't have a problem. Satan kills bad people and good people if he can, and our Father kills mostly bad people. But we've got two killers on our hands, but they try to sort out who's doing the killing. Scripture says that 70,000 people the Lord struck in David's kingdom because he was angry at David. If you believe that, you, you know nothing of our Father. It's written in the Bible. You believe it, you know nothing of our Father. I shouldn't say nothing. You know some outskirts about our Father. And there were babies and there were young people who hadn't done anything wrong. And God just slaughtered them. No. David's conduct gave the enemy the opportunity to set a plague on him. So if I understand, we just have to set the record straight. Our Father has endured the accusation of murderous conduct. For millennia, somebody has to draw a line in the sand at whatever cost. And I don't know that I'm willing to draw a line in the sand for whatever cost, but I'm certainly willing to draw a line in the sand for the cost of successful ministry. Right. And that makes it easy for me to make an excuse for a failing ministry, too. All right, so we're going to look at the scriptures. How many of you here actually know the name Methuselah and why people know him? Raise your hand. Methuselah. Okay. Methuselah is the longest living man in the history of humanity. I was talking about Isaiah Salivar this morning, who's a fantastic preacher. He's 22 years old. And the whole time I was watching him, I kept saying, he looks just like Arnold. Looks just like Arnold. You feel any call the minister to praise Arnold? All right. So we're going to look at Genesis. chapter. He 
Again, verse 3. When Adam had lived 130 years, he became the father and son of his own likeness, according to his image, and named him Seth. Then the days of Adam, after he became the father of Seth, were 800 years, and he had other sons and daughters. So all the days that Adam lived were 930 years, and he died. Uh, there's a bunch, I'm not going to read the whole list, but there's a bunch of people listed here who lived seven, eight, nine hundred years. Um, if we, there's six of them that lived to be over 900 years. And if we go down to the bottom here, don't say you never learned anything here. And Methuselah 21. Enoch lived 65 years and became the father of Methuselah. Then Enoch walked with God 300 years after he became the father of Methuselah, and he had other sons and daughters. So all the days of Enoch were 365 years. Enoch walked with God and was not, for God took him. Methuselah lived 187 years and became the father of Lamech. Then Methuselah lived 782 years after he became the father of Lamech, and he had other sons and daughters. So all the days of Methuselah were 969 years. 969 years. Now, <clears throat> brothers and sisters, I believe that. You know why I believe it? It's, it's, it's totally absurd. But it witnesses to me. The Spirit of God is in us. And if you're praying every day and seeking the Lord, when you word, read a word of truth, it will witness to you. If it's hard for you to swallow that God killed this person in a fit of anger, it's because it's not true. Let's just look. Let's see. Isaiah 65, 22. They will not build and another inhabit. They will not plant and another eat. For as the lifetime of a tree, so will be the days of my people. And my chosen ones will wear out the work of their hands. So this is much later. And the prophet Isaiah says, My people will live to be the age of trees. Jesus says, Life is in my Father, and he has given me that life, and I give it to you. Well, what do we need it for? We already are alive. Jesus has come to restore. He's come to make new, but he's also come to restore. It's my opinion that God created Adam and Eve and those who followed to live forever. And when sin entered in, God did not curse them, but unclean spirits entered into them and began to explore how to, how to bring them down, how to bring an end to them. And it took them hundreds of years to figure it out. Fearfully and wonderfully, your bodies have been made. They're made to renew themselves. The flesh will not renew itself on its own. It needs to be filled with the Spirit of God, and then the, the flesh and the Spirit work together for life, for renewing life. Can you understand that? They work together. The flesh by itself cannot cannot live on and on and on. But the Spirit of God is like energy that enables it to renew, enables the, the thalamus, the hypothalamus, the pituitary, the pineal gland to do what they're supposed to do and to keep doing it. And, and, no, and, and our best scientists to this day do not understand what life is and how to extend it other than to treat symptoms. But the devil figured it out. But it took him a long time to figure it out. And so Methuselah is living on to 960 whatever years, and, these, and Adam lived to be 900, and they were living to be 700 and 300, because the enemy had not yet learned how to draw them down. Does that make sense? It is true, in my opinion. And we're headed back there. Hallelujah, we're headed back there. You've heard of the movie Back to the Future. Our future is to live on and on. But, it's, but we're going to go back to the condition we were so we can live on and on. Back to the future. It's the way we were. 
That's the way we will be. And I read you the Isaiah passage that says, as the age of trees, as the age of trees, my people will be. Scripture says that the water came out under the gate of the great temple. And the man of God said it came up to his ankles. And then he went out another thousand cubic cubits and it came up to his knees. He went out another thousand and it came up to his thighs. And then he went out and it was a great river that no one could ford. And the trees on the banks of that river lived forever. And they did not cast their fruit or cast their leaves because their roots went down into the living water. And Jesus says, I've come to cast fire on the earth. But he also says, I've come to, to build in you a spring of living water, the same water coming out of the gate. And it will become in you a fountain welling up unto everlasting life. The, the actual translation is age-long life. 900, 1,000 years, I can tell you, if you make it to 900, you're going to make it on. You, you, you made it, you've beaten it. So when you tell somebody, my pastor thinks you're supposed to live, and they say, well, that idiot, why are you doing it? You should come to my church. Doesn't he know that the scripture says if you're given three score and ten years, that's seventy. You understand that the scripture was written, written backwards. After all of these things happened, then, then men took pen and parchment, quill and parchment, and wrote, wrote about it thousands of years after it happened. They weren't right that this was happening. So the enemy was already killing us at 70 and 80 years old. And so they wrote, God said you're only going to make it to 70. Well, goodbye, devil. I'm about to go. It's nonsense. Okay, it's fantastic. We did live, we are living, and we're going to live. And the first step to that, the first step to that is saying, I think so. Yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm going to embrace that. I'm going to investigate that. And then the Lord will start to tell you things that you're doing that are killing you. As soon as you say, yes, I want to embrace that. Bingo. You start on the path of life and he will start to tell you the things that you're doing that are killing you. So that you can live. Scripture says, I, I, sh I should read this to you. <coughs> so the Lord is talking to Moses. No, I'm sorry, to Noah. Verse 5 of the 6th chapter of Genesis. Then the Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great on the earth, and that every intent of the thoughts of his heart was only, was only evil continually. The Lord was sorry that he had made man on the earth, and he was grieved in his heart. And the Lord said, I will kill them all. I am going to kill them. I am so sorry. It was a big mistake. It's all wrong. I'm going to kill them all. I'm going to blot out man whom I have created from the face of the land. From man to animals to creeping things to birds of the sky, for I am sorry that I made them. Dang, I wish we could find a better God. First of all, he created a man without a woman. He created, he created animals, male and female, but he created a man without a woman. And he watches it for quite a while. He says, gee, this isn't working out. I, I better try to remedy this. I better make him a helper. My man is, is my main man. That's 
sure he cares about it. But he needs a helper to really be happy. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna make him a helper. It's true, I made a mistake, but I'm gonna fix my mistake. Now he says, the whole creation that I made, they've all gone bananas. I made another huge mistake. I got to correct it. I got to kill them all and start over. Two big mistakes. Gee, I wish we could find a God who didn't make those kind of crazy mistakes. We found them. what men wrote thousands of years later that's wrong. But men will die for them and defend that with their lives. I was one of those when I first came here and this church was doubling every year. I was, I defended against the professors at Fuller. Those idiots, if they only believed God would minister to them and show them that every word of the scripture is infallible, it's perfect. Those idiots. See, people, people want to make the book more important than the Lord. Yeah. They don't care what the book says about the Lord. They just care that it's the book. So whatever's in the book where we worship, that's what's true. Regardless, don't bother me with the nature of my Father and our nature of the Lord Jesus. It's the book. Brothers and sisters, there is no book on the earth more important than the Bible. There are fantastic, world-changing, life-saving truths. We would be lost without the book. But the book is man's reflection of our Father and of the blessed Lord Jesus. And they get so much of it right. But when they say, Gee, I made a serious mistake. Now I gotta kill them all. They attribute to our Father the work of Satan. The flood, the evidence, the physical evidence is the flood didn't cover the whole earth. It covered the whole earth that the writers knew of, as far as they had traveled, as far as they understood, it had covered. And there, there's evidence in, in other countries of a great flood. But in, in many countries on the other side of the earth, they, they never heard of it and there was no flood. It was that, listen, <clears throat> Jesus is, and his disciples are on the Sea of Galilee. And Jesus has just been, he's been healing people, he's been pulling loaves of bread out of heaven, he's been counseling them, don't do that anymore. He's been he sat down on the cushion in the back of the boat as they're going across the <coughs> Sea of Galilee. <coughs> the scripture says a violent tempest. So that means it's small, but very violent. And it's aimed right at their boat. And the waves are coming over the side and the boat is literally like this. And they go to the back and wake up the Lord. And they say, don't you care that we're perishing? Can't you see what's happening here? And the scripture says the Lord rouses himself steps to the side of the boat and says to his father, Father, knock it off. We're not in the mood for a storm right now. Maybe you can bring it some other time, Father. No, he doesn't say that. He steps to the side of the boat and he rebukes the storm. Who else does the Lord rebuke? He rebukes Satan. Satan brought that storm to try to kill the Messiah and kill his disciples. And the Lord rises up and takes authority over it and rebukes it. He says, stop it. When people talk about acts of God, God didn't bring this tornado, that, that this hurricane is killing so many, many people in the Philippines. Satan's bringing it and killing our brothers and sisters. Satan brought the great storm and tried to kill God's creation. He, he didn't want to kill all of them because he needs us. That's why the flood didn't cover the face of the earth. But 
it covered the whole civilized world. Yeah. Satan needs us, but he needs to keep us under control. He needs to keep us at certain numbers, and he's not doing it. We're outgrowing him. He's getting more and more violent in his ways. People shooting up malls and killing their mothers. And, but he's still losing brothers and sisters. There's revivals breaking out all over this land. Satan brought that flood and tried to kill the people of God through whom the Messiah was going to come. Let's just look at some other scriptures. What time is it? Jesus has gotten a reputation when he was in the when he was in the land of the Gadarenes, you know the story of a demoniac who, who was naked, uh, lived amongst the tombs, gashed himself with stones, howled all night long. The people of the village were afraid, and so they got torches and chains and went out and did mob and subdued him and chained him. And they didn't want him coming in the night and threatening their children. And he just tore the chains asunder. Nobody could subdue him. And when Jesus walks up, he comes, comes running up to Jesus and falls at Jesus' feet. The devils hide out. They die down, and the man that is the demoniac is able to respond to Jesus. But as soon as he gets there, and the heat is on, the river meets the road, the devils come back to protect their territory, and, and so then there's this conflict between the gathering demoniac and Jesus. And Jesus, for some reason that I don't understand yet, I think it's because the place of the dead had not been cleared out yet, and there was no other place to send them sends them into the swine. There's 2,000 head of swine. Now, 2,000 head of swine, that's a lot of meat, and if they're selling it, that's a lot of money. They would butcher those swine and salt the meat, and it would be, it would be their life through the winter. It'd be their food supply, or sell it and get money, and use the money to trade and live on during the winter. And so when the Spirits go out of the gathering demoniac into the swine and they all run into the river, into the sea and drown. All that, all that's gone. Jesus did, just did that. Now it's my opinion that if those people had embraced the Lord Jesus, he would have seen to it that they were attended to. But instead it scares them and turns them against him. And the word travels. So he and his disciples are headed back for Jerusalem, his final trip. It makes it back and forth about three times probably. They're headed back for Jerusalem, and they need some, uh, they need some sustenance, some food, and so forth, and they come to this little town. So this is the ninth chapter of Luke. When the days were approaching for his ascension, he was determined to go to Jerusalem, and he sent messengers on ahead of him, and they went and entered a village on the, of the Samaritans, to make arrangements for him. But they did not want to receive him because he was traveling towards Jerusalem. When his disciples, James and John, saw this, they said, Lord, do you want us to do what our fathers have done in the past? Do you want us to kill them all? When his disciples, James and John, saw this, they said, Lord, do you want us to command fire to come down from heaven and consume them? But he turned and rebuked them. Now why is he rebuking his disciples? He's rebuking his disciples because an unclean spirit, a reptilian monster, is speaking out of them about death. It has taken them over and said, Do you want us to kill them? How was that for a monster voice? <laughs> Do you want us to kill them? But he turned and rebuked them and said, You do not know what kind of spirit you are of. You are of the spirit of my father who used to kill them by the thousands all the time. No. He said, You are speaking under the power of a demonic spirit. You do not know what kind of spirit you are of. For the Son of Man did not come to destroy men's lives, but to save them. 
Now the scripture says that the Lord Jesus is the exact representation of the Father. Well, he's the exact representation of the new Father. The new Father who's kind of grown up and got over his fits of anger, his fits of killing. There, Jesus is the exact representation of the new Father. No. Scripture says he is the exact representation of the Father who is the same yesterday, today, and forever. What's wrong? It's the understanding of men and how they see the nature of God. When Satan kills a bunch of people, they blame it on God. That's why I'm talking about setting the record straight, brothers and sisters. The Son of Man did not come to destroy men's lives. And I am the exact representation of the Father. He has never been about destroying men's lives. And here's the last phrase. But to save them. Always our Father has been about saving them. Not from a hell that can't be shown to a heaven that can't be known, but to save their lives. And he sent his son to save their lives. And every one of our lives is more precious than anybody can imagine. The devil cheapens life. The devil slaughters us. The devil causes us to smoke and do drugs and eat things we shouldn't eat. And he deminimizes the value of our life and our flesh. There's nothing more valuable on this earth anywhere than you in your flesh. And he sent his son to retrieve it. Not to live 70 years. To live 900 years. Yet the writers of the Old Testament just whimsically say he slaughters these most valuable beings by the thousands. Curses them. Do you get that? We are the most valuable thing on this earth. He sent his son to redeem us. He tried himself, and we would not listen. And the scripture says, these people are all bad. I made a mistake creating these people. I'm going to kill them all. He didn't say it, brothers and sisters. The writers of the Old Testament attributed the work of Satan to our blessed Heavenly Father. And we couldn't get it. We continue to believe it. One of my best friends. You can just leave the cane down there, man. One of my best brothers who comes to pray for Darcy said to Darcy, just like the Lord opened Adam's side and took out a rib and made a woman as an afterthought and sealed it up perfectly, he's going to seal you up. to save men's lives. Not save their souls, they're already saved. So you desire to murder. So we have our Father who desires to save us, to save our lives, not our souls. They're saved already. To save our lives. He desires to save our lives. Always has, always will, and does at this moment. It says Satan and those who follow him desire. They desire, they long to kill us. It's in them. I remember seeing him picture of that Russian serial killer. And I don't know how the camera caught him, but his mouth was open and his eyes were full of uh, horror. And under, underneath they had a quote. And the quote was something like, there's nothing as glorious as your first kill. Those devils gave him so much pleasure at killing an innocent that he could hardly bear the hardly stand the pleasure of it. There's nothing as glorious 
as your first kill. Is our father like that? Isn't he as far opposite of that as anything could be? Yet the scripture is full of his killing. You've got to figure it out, brothers and sisters. theological and spiritual enemy if it isn't poured over with uh, hours of, of prayer on your knees before him. A million women have been burned at the stake because it says in the scripture you shall not allow a witch to live. Okay, let's burn them up. to you from it every Sunday. But we have to sort it out. He's given, he's put his living word in our hearts that we might recognize him. And Christians call it a witness. So witness. When something true is said about our Father, about the Lord Jesus, he's put it inside of us for something to respond to that and say, yes, yes, that's true. Now the enemy can cover that. People can say wrong things, but I tell you, if the, if the people of God are on their knees with an honest heart, seeking the truth and seeking the Lord and reading the scriptures, I guarantee you shall find it. You shall find it. And his truth is the most fantastic blessing that gives hope for life. I'm an old man my 70th year. And yet I walk around. I feel like I'm 30, 35 years old. I'm full of expectation, full of hope. It's from the Spirit of the Lord. And if I continue to change my life and to seek Him, you will see it in my body as well as in my spirit. It's the true gospel. It's the true good news. It's glorious. Now remember, we're going to have a little healing line up here. Those of you who help help us pray, and you who are sick, you've been healed at some time, or feel the Spirit of God moving you. I want you to pray over others too. I don't know how this is going to go. I was hoping that Darla <coughs> could find someone to help her sing. I see the Emilio's strong out here. So, uh, maybe you can just uh, do several. And I don't know, maybe, maybe somebody wants to help him sing. But um, I'm going to give you the benediction so that those of you who do, do not wish to stay for this part of the service, you can go home. But anybody who, who is suffering any kind of illness that they want prayer for, come up here. And not only will I pray for you, but the other prayer warriors that pray will pray for you. And then when you're, when you're done, feel like you've gotten the prayer that you want, you can, you can just leave. And then I'll be sitting on my chair to pray for other things and to hear counsel. The, the benediction, brothers and sisters, hallelujah, continue to be filled with that marvelous light in the spirit that comes straight out of the heart of the Lord Jesus Christ. Be healed, be strengthened, be guided in all your paths by the Lord, and go your way in peace. And peace be with you, with your families, with your homes, and with all that you do. In Jesus' name. Amen. Would you come up if you want prayer?
Just line up to the to the left of uh, to uh, Archie's left. Now to her left. 